Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Norris. We're going to grow your leadership through neuroscience, psychology, and theology. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. Today's episode is with the skipper of the Kansas City Royals Major League Baseball team. And what an amazing conversation we have. April 1st is the opening day for the 2021 season, and what better way to celebrate that than to have manager Mike Matheny with us here at Red Ink Revival. You're going to love his story, his principles, and his strength forged in faith but blended with humility. With Mike at the helm, I couldn't be more proud to be a Kansas City Royals fan. And the Royals are going places, and I'm optimistic it can happen this year. I can hardly wait for the season to get started. I loved my time together with Mike, and I believe you will too. Let's go now to this week's episode. Welcome everybody to the Red Ink Revival Leadership Podcast. I am so excited today to have Mike Matheny with us as our guest. He is the manager of the Major League Baseball's Kansas City Royals. He played for 13 seasons as a catcher. He holds the MLB record for consecutive games without an error. Four times the Rawlings Gold Glove Award winner. He managed in MLB for eight seasons. Uh, He's the first manager in MLB history to guide a team to playoffs in each of the first four seasons. He's been married to Kristen for 27 years. Together they have five adult children, and he is a Jesus man as the center of his life everywhere he goes. And Mike, Thank you, man, for being a part of our Red Ink Revival podcast. It's a pleasure, Patrick. Thank you. Well, let's jump right in. I I want to talk a little bit about your backstory and how did you get into baseball? Just a little bit of an overview of your baseball history. I think like most, um, my dad was a a baseball fan, grew up in the hills of West Virginia, farm boy, the oldest of eight, but somehow got introduced to the game and uh, fell in love with it, actually chased it, uh, chased it up into a tryout in Columbus, Ohio, which uh, didn't work out so well with the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates at the time, um, but decided to stay there. And uh, myself and and my three brothers all just, uh, we we got initiated into the game by being exposed to it by the passion that my dad had. And I started playing on, I still have a trophy uh, that says uh, 1977, so I must have been six years old that summer. And um, and, and I know that we won all of our games, but uh, the thing I remember about that is I do remember uh, some parents not being too happy because I ran all over the field. Uh, no matter what position I was at, I seemed to be running the ball down um, in front of their kids. But uh, just a, I knew early <laughs> on that uh, I loved competing, playing sports, and uh, the baseball thing clicked very early for me. That's amazing. And then, of course, you, uh, in time, I guess you played high school ball. I did. You ended up hitting uh, the campus at Michigan. You played ball at Michigan in college, correct? That's right. That's right. And then, uh, then you got picked up out of college. Talk just a little bit about what enters you into uh, Major League Baseball. Well, the... Um the minor league route uh, was, I, I wanted to play professional baseball, and, and every kid, I believe, that uh, does that it has goals and aspirations of making it to the major leagues, but uh, you realize that every step you take, you're beating a lot of odds, uh, even getting to high school. There are a lot of kids that start playing early on that don't even play in high school, let alone the privilege of playing in a university. I, I took my education serious, and so a degree from the University, uh, university of Michigan was something that I was very, very proud of. The first in my family to graduate from a four year university. Um, So after I started in the minor leagues, I had to go back my following two off seasons uh, as a professional player and carry 20 hours and then 21 hours and an internship just to finish. And uh, that was a major accomplishment for me, just knowing that uh, there are no certainties in this game, um, trying to uh, make sure that uh, I finished something that I started and um, and then jumped in and tried to see how, how long I could uh, hang on in the professional ranks and fortunately able to, to be able to make a, a better career than I think most people thought I would. Oh my gosh, well, your career is uh, just filled with uh, highlights and uh, just reading up on you in preparation for the uh, conversation today. Uh, the gold gloves, uh, I mean, to get one gold glove, that's impressive. But to, uh, to get four, that's, it's, it's crazy. 
So back to Michigan, while you're there, you have uh, a parallel story, of not just baseball, but really the bigger part is that you met your uh, future wife, Kristen. And uh, talk just a little bit about uh, that side of it as you're trying to navigate the focus of a career. You know, in baseball, it's not like you can just be distracted by any interest that comes along. A lot of guys think, you know, I just I need to stay disciplined on the game. But Kristen shows up and all of a sudden you begin to, I'm sure, juggle both of those. Talk just a little bit about meeting her and what that was like as you were pursuing your dream of professional baseball. Well, I'll give you a little longer story than what you wanted, but uh, I, I was drafted by the Blue Jays out of high school. And back then they had rights to you until you went into your very first class. And so right up until the morning of my first class, um, there was negotiations going back and forth to the point where uh, they, they offered something that was very hard to turn down. And I'm uh, literally praying, um, you know, God, give me wisdom here. I, I'm not I'm not. I'm not set up to, to make big decisions like this. Um, very good, very controlling, no family. My parents were very smart to keep their thumb on me all the time. And so, but on this one, they're like, this is yours. And so didn't feel like I was equipped. Uh, but anyway, I'm praying through this deal. God, make it obvious which, which way I'm supposed to go. Felt like I was really supposed to get my degree. I was only 17. I started college early. Um, and so uh, they make their final offer. I walk out the door going to my first class wondering if I made the right decision. I take a step outside of the dorm and there, apparently there was a, a pigeon the size of a, a small turkey on the roof and it hit me right on top of my head. And, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. To the point where I had to turn around and start all over. I had to shower and it was going to be late for my first class and I thought, God, you know, I, I've asked for a clear decisions before and to give me wisdom and I never thought you would use a, a, a pigeon but you know what I laughed look in the mirror and said you know what I, I'm supposed to go to college and I walked in that very first class and in the front row was a blonde from St. Louis who I ended up marrying a wow. number of years later but um, Kristen was there playing uh, field hockey and it took until uh, about our junior year before we actually started dating but um, I'll never forget that uh, that story because it, it uh, was the greatest decision I ever made was to stick it out, uh, one for the education, but more importantly, uh, the love of my life and the mother of my five children. Amazing, yeah. that is so cool. That's a funny story. Yeah. Um, well, let's dive into your uh, spiritual life. You know, you're talking about that you have this offer from the Blue Jays. You're trying to navigate uh, the decision. You don't feel equipped. You're praying, God, give me wisdom. Somewhere in there, I'm hearing a God story, and Jesus had already planted seeds in your heart. So let's go back to your spiritual side of the story and move through. Uh, was there a moment that your heart awakened to the fact that Jesus was radically in love with you and that he had become the sacrifice for your salvation and the forgiveness of your sin? Tell us, tell us a little bit about what happened and how that resonated. Yeah, I, I grew up in the church, like a lot of kids will give you that, but I literally, my mom was uh, one of the secretaries at our church, and so um, sick days I was in church, vacation days I was at church. I mean, we just were more comfortable being in church, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, uh, an independent Baptist church, great place to grow up. I had a lot of Bible teaching, but I just thought this is what kids do. and. Um, at a very early age, didn't realize it, but I'd become very religious. I, I could quote you a, a ton of scriptures. Uh, I knew when to stand up, sit down, what kind of clothes I could wear, uh, how to act where I wouldn't get my dad uh, hot at me during the middle of a service. And you know, I knew the routine and felt really good about it, but there was one particular day and it was, it was a revival, a tent revival, and it was hot. I couldn't understand why they would do this in the middle of summer. Uh, we had a guest speaker, a Southern Baptist preacher who was just pounding his Bible and, and uh, bringing hellfire and brimstone. But, but um, God spoke to me that night and, and I never forget, went home and, and kind of had that um, Jacob experience of wrestling with God. I couldn't get some things off my mind. This guy was calling us out, um, kind of keep going back towards a, you know, a lukewarm. And, and, and who, who is Jesus to you? I don't care about how many times you show up. I don't care about what all your roles are at the church. Uh, who is Jesus to you? And, and I didn't have a great answer to that. I, I knew I knew all the words, I knew all the terms, but as far as making it personal, it never happened. And so um, I went to the greatest source of wisdom that I had at that particular time, which was my brother in the bunk above me and, and started to answer you know, one question at another and, and, and 
felt that he might be able to help me. And in all his wisdom, he told me um, to shut up and go to sleep. And so figured I'd tapped uh, out everything that he had for me. And at that point, um, went out in, into the living room, which we were not allowed to leave in our bedrooms, uh, unless there was blood or, or if you were sick. Um, but I had enough uh, courage to get out of bed and go ask my parents, who then opened up God's word and walked me through the, through the book of Romans and, and told me how I could know for myself uh, how to be in right standing with our God through our Savior Jesus. And, and made a decision that day. And I often tell people, you know, I, I never, claim that, uh, you know, from that day on, I wore clip-on ties and carried an eight-pound King James Bible through the, through the public school system. Um, but I, I, knew for, I knew that I knew and yeah. that, that God's hand was with me and the Spirit was guiding me and more often than not, giving me a little backhand uh, to the back of the head to, hey, this isn't what you signed up for. And uh, it, it just began that walk um, and, and set that in place to, that this this is the, the day that uh, I proclaim that Jesus is my Savior. And from then on, it was just, it was that in, increasing relationship and walk. Um, and then it really became my own when I did get away uh, and at the University of Michigan, made enough mistakes and experimented with this so-called freedom that everybody celebrates so much to realize that it's just a crock. And, um, and then got back to that commitment that, uh, that I knew uh, I was called to. And uh, he was faithful to be there and walk with me that entire time. Hey everybody, I want to slide right in here and thank you for joining us for today's episode. Let me ask you for a huge favor. If this podcast is providing value to you, would you consider subscribing to it wherever you get your podcasts? Also, if you feel that it would be valuable to somebody else, please like it, comment on it, and share it on your social media feeds like YouTube, Facebook, or wherever you populate networking. And one more big, big favor. If you like the show, please go review it. And if it's true for you, give us five stars. And when you review it and rate it, it gives our efforts greater opportunity to grow. And that would mean the world to us. Now let's go back to this week's episode. So I hear this piece where your parents had you in church, your mom's the church secretary. And while you are growing up, it wasn't optional. You were in church every time the doors were open. In today's world of even Christianity as a whole, often church is looked at more as an optional thing. Who's speaking? What's the series? There's this consumeristic kind of approach. And what you're saying is, is that your faith in God was only catalyzed because your parents consistently made you as a family an owner of this life in community, this life in church, so that an opportunity like a Southern Baptist preacher pounding his Bible could actually draw your heart by the Holy Spirit in. What would you say to parents today? What would you say to just every, you know, Joe and Sally around how important is the local church in terms of God's plan for your life. And not just going to a local church, but living in community. Because one of the things that I like to, to say is that if a relationship doesn't have history, it's only an acquaintance. Mm. Once you have history and you've developed memories and you watch God show up in your life, it does stuff to you that you couldn't get any other way. So talk just a minute about you know how you view relationships in a local church. Well, I believe we're made to be in community. That's how we were created. And um, I know right now in 2020, that has been more difficult than any other time in, in, uh, in our history. And, um, and, and it's tough. Uh, I believe that there are a lot of things that, that go wrong when uh, we get secluded. And uh, that whether that's in a leadership position or and certainly with our faith, and uh, that's made more of a challenge than any time uh, what we're, we're going through right now. And fortunately for me, uh, the introduction was made uh, because we didn't have an option, the introduction to who Jesus was. But the, the real meat of it was watching people. And my parents in particular, not that I hold them to this uh, high level of expectation of, of being infallible. Uh, right. I, I know that they had their struggles, but I also know that they they lived it out. And so were the people, uh, for the majority of the, the point, uh, 
the part of the people, the people in our church who live, were living this out and walking it. It was easy to talk about it, but I think what stood out to me was watching people love and serve each other. And that happens in community. And that's what we're called to do. You know, I always have the pleasure of signing a Bible verse on the bottom uh, of my autograph. The autograph's absolutely worthless, but the verse is priceless. And yes. it's uh, John three sixteen. And I, and I keep getting stuck on those first few words, for God so loved the world. And you only do that by getting your hands dirty and getting in the world. And uh, part of that is uh, just having the community of of uh, like-minded people to be equally yoked and then encouraging each other. And, uh, and then, you know, you have those challenges of uh, just making this real as we get out uh, and, and get our hands dirty, even outside the churches. You know, I, I believe that I was always called into a ministry, but my ministry's on uh, a beautiful grass field with four bases and dirt and, and in those clubhouses. And it's in, in those spaces uh, where people are gonna see what, what's real um, through, um, 162 games in 180 days, guys are gonna see what you're really made of and what drives you. And, and I think it's been the influence of people inside the church, people who have loved and mentored and taught and continued to, to reach out to me uh, that have helped me realize uh, what it looks like to, to be in community in the church, but also to be in community in this world. Yeah, yeah. As, as you are back in college, so, you know, high school even, then you get into college, uh, then you start your uh, trek towards minor leagues and then finally make it to the bigs. So during all of that, you have uh, unusual power, you have unusual fame, you have unusual temptations that come along with all of that. Um, and yet your faith, you continued to grow. How did you grow when, again, sometimes in life you have these dreams and it seems like, yes, and then it's a, you know, five feet forward and a hundred feet backwards and disappointment seizes, stress is on you. You know, even if you're not swinging the bat like you want to, or you're not catching, you make an error and then that one error can sometimes be a defining moment for decisions around you. And all of this massive stress that your dream is hanging on, and then all the temptation, because that's a, that's a cocktail of stress and then fame and then power and then dreams and identity. How did you spiritually keep yourself grounded and, and even grow in your faith during those seasons? Uh, accountability. Well, first and foremost is the gift of, of the Spirit. And I talked about even early on, I felt God's hand and, um, and uh, just the, the guiding of the Spirit with, um, with just knowing uh, and being reminded of, of the, the commitment that I did make. But all along the way, and you, you talked earlier about the church, you know, with what we do, we don't have the, the privilege of being in church during the season because we play on Sundays. Um, one in particular stood out in my mind. It was my very first season. I was playing in Helena, Montana, which is right in the middle of nowhere, but my kind of country. Um, but uh, very first uh, Sunday, uh, and we didn't know the routine. Um, a gentleman walked in dressed in preacher clothes, um, but we didn't know who he was. He was an official with the organization. That's all we knew. And he walked in and said, guys, we have chapel outside in the stands in five minutes. And he refused or neglected to tell us this was an optional deal. So the entire clubhouse stands up and we go out into the stands and we're sitting there and, and this guy had a, had a great opportunity um, to take this in a couple different directions, but uh, his boldness, I'll never forget it. He stood up and goes, guys, I just wanna tell you, I'm like most people, I, I, I admire the talent you have and what you've been able to do. And I've got my own story about how I could have been a, a, this or that as an athlete, but for me to sit here and try and get you to be impressed with me would be a complete waste of your time. What you need to know today is that there's a God that loves you and that you have an opportunity to respond to this gift in the, in the gift of his son and uh, to live apart from him uh, is, a, is a life that's gonna be eternally separated from him. And I'll never forget that I looked up and, and I'm like, wow, preach it, man, you know? But I'm looking around, these guys' eyes, they're, they're as big as saucers because uh, I think a few of them walked in and thinking they were going to 
first of all, they thought this was a baseball meeting. Secondly, I think if, if they did figure out this was a faith base, that somebody was going to, you know, say, may you get four hits today or throw a shutout, I don't think they were <laughs> ready for truth. And um, this gentleman took advantage of that, that opportunity. And through that summer, like I had different men uh, throughout my career, um, continued to challenge me and you know, make sure that, hey, you have learned enough about this. You are solid enough in the scriptures. Uh, you've been in this walk long enough. It's time for you to be available for when that opportunity presents itself. And, and then to go and encourage wow. and challenge and love people. And I believe that's what we're called to do. Um, I've never had the personality of going in and standing on my chair. I've had teammates who would stand up and say, you know what, turn or burn or get left uh, if, if you don't get right and you know, those sort of things. But um, I, I've always believed that it, we go and, and we love people by, by barbecuing. We love people by um, being honest and real and, and spending life with them and been able to be encouraged by people uh, almost in every city I've ever played in, pastors, people of the local church who have surrounded and prayed and continued to, to challenge and encourage me to grow and then be available and be aware and, and constantly be in prayer. God, uh, what is it you'd have me to do today? And help me not to miss those opportunities when there's somebody here that that uh, that I can be a part of their story. Yeah. yeah. Let me jump in again and tell you about two amazing opportunities for pastors, spouses, and senior leaders of ministry that will increase your leadership. And they're both free. I'm talking about monthly Zooms and also weekly process groups. First, we hold a monthly Zoom event that is one plus hours with Dr. Todd Bowman, a psychologist and human behavior expert, and me. We usually have around 15 to 30 other participating pastors, spouses, and leaders. The monthlies have been amazing to help pastors collaborate around tactics, personnel challenges, and even how to navigate our own inner world. The skills you'll learn and a newfound pastoral community will expand your leadership mapping with everybody you lead. These monthly Zooms happen every month on the second Mondays at 6 p.m. Central Time. And then the second opportunity for pastors and spouses is our weekly process group that spans for six weeks. In our weekly process group, we provide tools that guide you into your story and help you rediscover you, redefine leadership, redeem life, and redream ministry. Weekly process groups give time to open your stories as you collect the dots, connect the dots, and correct the dots. Attunement begins with you making sense of your story. When you live with mindful attunement to your story, you'll find that the people you lead will begin to also make leadership sense to you in profound new ways. Our alumni tell us that this is one of the most impactful experiences they have ever had. We place ladies in groups of six to 10, and also we put men in groups of six to 10. The value of the weekly experience is 900 plus dollars per person. However, in this season, we're offering it to you for free. You can see some of our alumni sharing stories on our events web pages. You can find out everything you need to know to get involved in either the monthlies or the weekly process groups by going to redinkrevival.com. I hope to see you there soon. What are some of the spiritual exercises that have become routine for you? What are some things, if you don't mind, I mean, this is a very deeply personal part of our own life before God. Um, and yet, when I talk to a, a lot of young Christians or inexperienced Christians, they sometimes have a struggle to frame up, what would it look like for me to have a daily connect, a daily time, a daily uh, enrichment where God's thoughts are now then being uh, taken into consideration, they're influencing me. Um, what would be maybe an insight to the way, it doesn't have to be spectacular, it's not for me, but uh, what's kind of a way that you go about your daily routine with Jesus? Yeah, um, always evolving too, right? And uh, we've got those times where we're um, hitting it better than other times, and, yep. uh, just uh, as guilty as everybody else. But um, for the most part, when, when I'm right and uh, when I've uh, got things in the right place, 
Um, you know, I, I don't uh, even let my feet hit before the floor before my knees do. And, and just in um, gratitude, um, try to stay in, in constant communication, um, whether it's in um, repentance or whether it's uh, in whatever's on my heart, trying to be real with God, yes. but starting the day that way. And I, and I like to finish the day the same way. Uh, that's something that was taught to me a long time ago. It's just been part of my routine. And sometimes those prayers are um, a whole lot um, more hollow than others. Um, <laughs> right. But the routine's right, uh, beginning and ending my day. Uh, the next thing that uh, somebody challenged me with is one of the things probably most important in my life is um, I, obviously getting into God's Word. I don't think any Christian would tell you that uh, um, you can run this race without doing that. Yeah. And um, for me, it, it's been a number of years. I don't can't even keep track of how many of going through a daily Bible. Um, I'd, I'd like to say it's a one-year Bible, but it turns into a, a year and a half Bible, sometimes a <laughs> two-year really, Bible. I need to kind of really. change it. Um, but I, I've also learned to, to journal in those. And so I've done one for each of our kids. Um, I'm on our third grandchild now of giving them a year, sometimes a year and a half to two years of my life to, to where I am journaling to them individually that this is kind of what's going on in my life. Here's something I'm struggling with. Here's something I see God at work at. And then going through the scripture and kind of highlighting some things like, hey, this is something you really need to memorize or, man, I don't understand why this is even in here, but this is probably where this is coming from and just trying to pass uh, and I always thought uh, you know if I had something like that from my grandfather or oh, from my dad uh, and I will tell you right now if uh, my house was burning down and everybody was out safe uh, that stack of Bibles which I give to them now on their wedding day and uh, we've had three of them married where I've been able to uh, pass it on to them but those are the most important things probably in our home uh, once we get uh, the people safe. But uh, besides that, um, try to then uh, start my day um, getting some exercise, try to stay in shape. And uh, the, the U version has been huge for me, uh, bouncing different studies. Um, try to get a couple of those in every day and also bouncing in uh, to Jesus Calling. I thought uh, Sarah Young and, yeah. and what she has done there it just continues to speak to me year after year after year. Um, and then to me, just as much of that as I can take in before I jump in and get distracted with my day. And hopefully um, that foundation that I put in early on continues to give me wisdom beyond my own as I try to make good decisions through the day. You know, I, I think about how many times the Apostle Paul was addressing uh, the devil as a real personality. And we have these phrases like submit to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And sometimes we make these images of the devil out as our enemy is this generalization of some kind of uh, being, and I'm supposed to resist him. But when you really look at the text, you see that resisting the devil is resisting his thoughts, his emotions, his beliefs, his attitudes, his instincts, and his manner of life. Submitting to God is exactly the same. Submitting to God isn't just, I've submitted. It's, God, I'm submitting to your thoughts. That this culture, this world, this uh, whole time and season that we live in, there are demonic forces that are influencing supernaturally our thoughts. And when we submit to God, we're saying, God, your word says, I've got to have the influence of your word so that I can resist the thoughts the enemy would bring. And they are subtle. They're trickster thoughts. They are arguments and reasonings against God. When I think of that and Jesus saying, if you abide in me, my words abide in you, this whole idea of, of daily having his word influence our thinking, even when we don't know how it's influencing it, but to have the word come in and then connect to God in energy and relationship, prayer, so that in that interaction, we're again having this supernatural force of God's thoughts. That's exactly what you're talking about. That's what you are endeavoring to do. Now, nobody does it perfectly, but you have to be intentional. You have to organize it into your life, and you have to have it in relationships of your life. Who would be some of the relationships that you've had in your life, uh, both growing up, that helped put energy, put God's influence in your thinking that otherwise maybe it wouldn't be as strong because we all know that when we interact the energy rises something happens and so when you're a kid you're experiencing that now then even as let's do both 
as a professional, as a manager of a major league baseball team, who are some of the relationships in your life that you really draw the Jesus, you know, I'll call it energy, anointing presence from? Well, early on, I think we're all um, victims or um, the gift recipients of, of parents. Uh, in, in my case, uh, Jesus followers as parents, what a gift. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can't get past. Uh, and, and, you know, we come across some guys with some tough stories. And, and I've been um, given the gift of empathy uh, for at least trying to put myself in their shoes. Where would I be if, if I hadn't had parents who, who had lived out the faith and loved in a way that um, mine had. And uh, I'm, I'm humbled, grateful, uh, continue to tell them as I did yesterday, um, when, uh, when I remember um, just how, how thankful I am. So it started with them and, and, and certainly a, a God-fearing father, but also uh, got to know both of my grandfathers uh, in the incredible generation. I don't think our world's ever seen a, a generation like that. Um, who'd seen the things and the change that those men had seen. Uh, war heroes in World War II, uh, the stories to go along, but uh, the development of their faith in a, in a cool faith story that uh, they were able to share and I got to know uh, extremely well before they passed. So it started with family. And then um, obviously just through life, uh, you're exposed to more opportunities. And uh, I was introduced to a coach and a, a coach who uh, was part of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And FCA is something that's always been very near and dear to me because it takes a big part of who I am in sports. And I never really knew that there was this, this group um, or an organization that embraced uh, the influence that athletes can have and the unique challenges that come along with being an athlete that are also Christ followers. And so uh, that coach uh, exposed me to FCA in high school and, and then that continued to, to, to open up doors even through college. Um, but then once I, I got into uh, playing, uh, it was more of baseball chapel. Um, which I explained earlier, gentlemen who are local pastors that, that reach out and try and help uh, players that are in the minor league system and even the major league system. Uh, as a manager in, in late in life, now the people that speak to me the most, I, I've, um, I've called them actually my own personal board of advisors. Wow. And I was very fortunate. I had a mentor uh, who uh, we just became friends 30 years ago and has continued to challenge me in leadership even before I was a manager um, and, and encouraging me uh, to, to be very intentional about those relationships and how important. And I will tell you this, and I've told many young managers who have been able to jump in and, 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 and ask me you know, if there's something that you did really well, what would it be? And the, and the first thing I'd tell them is I surrounded myself with a group of men uh, that are truth tellers. Um, some of these guys were ready to hear the faith story, um, others not. Um, but the truth is, is these men were building me up in all the areas that I, I say are important. I say the most important thing in my life is my faith. Uh, these men call me out. Are, are your actions or how you spending your time lining up with what you say wow. is your number one priority? Uh, the next is my relationship with my wife. And I've got a couple of the men in that group who have carte blanche uh, to be able to call me out. You know, let me see your calendar uh, is the amount of time you're spending with her lining up with what you say your priorities are. And the next is obviously the, the rest of my family and our kids and, and, and um, being challenged in that way. And then obviously the one that is always on um, on the big stage is, is the job. It's a, it's a job that um, is in the limelight. And uh, to be able to have men um, who, who somewhat understand baseball, but more understand leadership and understand people and understand who I say I want to be, uh, whether it's managing um, the Kansas City Royals or, or whether it's, it's coaching a group of 10 year olds and, and how am I going about my business and am I being responsible with the gifts I've been given and the opportunities I've been given. And so these men have been invaluable to me. Um, uh, eight, uh, eight men, seven of which are older than me, uh, all eight of which are wiser and uh, continue to just challenge me to, to grow and challenge me in every area of my life. And if there's anything that I, I throw out to people, um, 
man, what a what a great gift uh, to be able to to walk through this thing, um, arm in arm and locked with people who truly not that they get it all right. They're not right. one of them. We're going to say that they do either. Um, but we're we're doing this thing together. And you were talking earlier about the, the power in the community and in the church. And the same thing goes power in the community of of. Um, iron sharpening and iron and uh, being able to know that uh, there are people that truly care about me regardless of how many games we went, right. um, regardless of uh, successes or failures or, or public perception. Uh, these men uh, want to see me grow. These men uh, want to see the success that comes from from making a marriage work and from continuing to love and serve uh, my kids and love and serve a community. And uh, to me, that's, that's, su that's success. Yeah. How would you like to reboot your personal finances this year? How would you like to take control of your money, turning small wins into big results? I want to encourage you to check out my wife, Tina's financial coaching business at tinanorris.org. You might be wondering, what is a financial coach? A coach is someone who will personally team up with you to outline financial goals, inspire you with energy, help you stay focused on your goals, and so much more. You can do it all through Zoom, and she provides a free initial consultation, so there's no pain or cost to you for your first steps. Maybe you've been to several Financial Peace University cycles, left with great intentions, but struggled to execute. You need a trainer, a coach, another human that won't shame or judge you to help you stay on track. Tina is a certified expert that will help you with clarifying financial dreams, understanding spending patterns, reviewing all financial obligations, assessing financial and insurance needs, defining a spending plan, understanding your emotional profile related to money, building margin for savings and emergency funds, learning strategies for attacking debt, and referring recommended financial advisors to multiply your tomorrow. And she isn't selling any products, policies, or investments. She is the ultimate financial teammate. As Tina's husband of 30 years, I can tell you firsthand how much of a difference Tina's skills and giftings have made. Our financial portfolio wouldn't be a fraction of what it is today if it wasn't for her. She works with clients that are single parents, everyday people, pastors and church staff, as well as high income professionals. I've known executives of Fortune 500 companies that manage billion dollar budgets at work, but then come home to complete financial disorder and disappointments. Shame roars at them as they face the stresses of marriage, kids, and struggling retirement plans. A personal trainer can change the way you think, emote, and behave. If you have friends, church members, clients, or even young marrieds that are launching their financial lives, you will do them all a favor to have them check out this amazing option. If professional athletes need a coach to win the day to fulfill their dreams, then you and I do too and you won't find anybody better to help you get there than Tina Norris. Set up your free consultation from anywhere in the world today. Go to tinanorris.org to find out all the details. I just think that is absolutely incredible that you have committed yourself to a group of relationships. Do you think this works though for a, a, a plumber, an attorney, uh, for your non high profile professional sports personalities. I mean, anybody who's just trying to do life, do you think it's important or it is doable for them to have the same principled group of, of people speaking into their lives? And if they don't have it, that it opens vulnerabilities to them. Would you agree with, with that? Well, I think 100%. And actually, um, this group kind of um, unofficially was put together after I finished playing and I was trying to figure out you know, where am I supposed to go next and it was one of these wise gentlemen that said listen you've got too many people that you know just ask them and that's what I would encourage anybody in any walk of life you know, who are the people that you respect the most um, and I've been I've been in, in the uh, I had the pleasure of being in the other side where people have come and asked me, would, would you serve 
in that role for me. Yeah. And what a great honor. And I would challenge anybody out there. Um, ask, and, and, and what you're asking from them is, you know, I try to approach it even like a board. Maybe once a quarter, man, we'll get together. And either, even if it's virtual, we'll do that. Yeah. I'd rather sit down for a cup of coffee and let's just get real. Um, but let's continue to touch base. And as needed, I'm going to throw some things at you. Like, hey, I'm stuck here. What do you got? And other times, and, and hopefully it's reciprocated. And with every one of these men, it is where I can be somebody that they lean on when they need something. But I would say in any walk of life, um, there's just people that we look up to and we admire, whether it's people in your trade or whether it's people at your church or people that, that you have a common faith with. Um, as you reach out, that's one of the greatest compliments you could ever be Boy. given. And, and then uh, I think those things either just naturally click or they don't. And um, for me, fortunately, um, you know, once again, these, these men have have committed for the long haul. And um, I just know I, I got some warriors that got my back. Yes. And once again, it, it has nothing to do. When I first started, I, I was an old, washed up, done baseball player that was coaching 10 year old Little League. That was basically kind of my gig. I was raising five kids with my wife, um, but I didn't have any high profile deal. Actually, I, I was on the, on the process of figuring out life past that. Yeah. And that's when these guys kind of surrounded me. Uh, I was going through some tough stuff and, yep. and needed some direction and needed some help. And um, it's amazing uh, when people show up like that. Um, they couldn't shake me if they tried. I love it. Oh, what, a, what an amazing uh, thing that, uh, that people need to hear on a regular basis because it seems that this, this world system is one where you isolate, you're independent, you try to figure it out on your own. I, if I'm smart, if I'm wise, if, if I need help, I'm stupid. If I need help, then I'm broken. If I need help, and yet what you're saying is, let's just make it common. We're all broken, we all need help. And if we will catalyze that to get a group of people around us that you know, there's something about uh, assembling of ourselves together to have a group of people that feel us, see us, know us, search us, care about us, pray for us, um, it's, it's huge. Um, a lot of our audience at Red Ink Revival are pastors. Uh, we really love to get into their lives and help them make sense of what has gone into their stories all the way to where they are today. Um, but as pastors, we, we're curious, how do we best lead, minister, how do we best pastor somebody who is a professional athlete or somebody who is like in the role you're in as a manager, what, so the question is, what do you need spiritually from a pastor? What is it that would light your heart up to make you feel like, now that satisfies me? What would it be? Hmm. Well, first of all, I'm grateful for the, the, the pastors out there. And, um, you know, one of my uh, close group is uh, is my pastor. Very fortunate that he's able to do that. Um, and, and I'm going to go off on a rabbit trail here for a second. I got to tell you, um, my, my pastor is probably the person that I pray for the most uh, outside of my family. And the more I'm exposed um, to whether it's um, leaders at high, high levels, uh, whether it's CEOs, um, people who are at the top, whether it's head coaches, um, but pastors fall into that category. Uh, and, and you mentioned it just a second ago. Um, th th sometimes with that position comes isolation. And I think that's really dangerous for all of us. Yes. Um, mostly because I think we get to that point where we're supposed to be the people that have the answers. Right. And um, I think too often we get so caught up in trying to find those answers uh, that, that we oftentimes uh, get away from having those and are allowing the people to come in and serve us and uh, challenge and grow us. And I, I think that's just a really dangerous place. Uh, I, I've seen it, um, and I can't say as much on the, on the, the pastoral side as much as um, in corporate leadership and in coaching. And so I continue to, to make sure um, that, that I'm making myself available. Um, I feel, and, and I'm type A, uh, I, I can get this done. Just leave, I'll figure it out. I'll fight my way through it. I, and I think that's the same with people in most areas of leadership. And I, and I just think that sets us up um, 
for probably some heartache that we wouldn't necessarily need. Um, so I would uh, encourage and challenge. I, I often say uh, to, my, to my pastor, you know, one of the things that is toughest about the job that I do is um, I love the, com the competition. I love the competing, uh, but you get you get all this negativism that comes yeah. at you, and uh, it's a whole lot easier for me to take knowing um, that that's part of the industry. But I know there's a lot of that coming, e even to pastors on Monday morning who are getting so much of the negativity and getting beat yeah. down, uh, and there's so many withdrawals. Um, I, I just want to encourage uh, to to find the people and find the places. Um, we're, we're in a, and allow, and I think it takes humility. I know it does on my part. It's forced at times to, to allow deposits. Yeah. And I think that that would be uh, the one thing that, that I know, um, getting back to your original question, um, I'm, I'm all about servant leadership. And past, pastors exemplify that more than anybody because Christ exemplified that more than anybody. Um, and I think it's allowing people to serve too. It's not just always serving. I think it's allowing it to be reciprocated to allow um, that regeneration to go do and to be who we're called to, to be. Hey, I wanna invite you, if you are listening and thinking, I have so many questions I would like to ask. We would love to address your questions on an upcoming episode. In fact, we may do an entire episode on the one question that you have. If you will simply email us at redinkrevival at gmail.com, we will catalog all of these questions and we would love to be able to address the things on your heart and on your mind. So be sure to get in touch with us and we'll take the journey together. Yeah, you know, a lot of times as pastors, you do experience the, the negativity. Every time somebody transitions out of the church, because the dream is deep relationship, it's the dream of connection and you know, every pastor really dreams of being able to sit on the porch with their leaders that they have poured into over a lifetime and one day being able to remember all the Goliaths that they took down mm -hmm. and that we did it together and we saw God, and God showed up and just all those amazing memories. And you think you're gonna marry the kids and you know, you're gonna lead the grandkids to Christ and you, you dream of that and then when people that you're very close to and you've given your life uh, for, they transition out, it can feel emotionally, depending on what your uh, emotional, psychological infrastructure is, it can feel like betrayal. It can feel like that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm emotionally now triggered with all the codependent type, uh, you know, momentum that I've had in my life that if they're unhappy, then I must be wrong. I did something wrong. I should have done more. And all of that begins to happen. So let's transition a little bit to hear what does it feel like? So digging into your story, um, you know, first of all, you didn't just immediately light everything up in uh, the major leagues. And you're, you know, you've got to take one step at a time to get there. Finally, I believe you're 23 when you finally get to be a catcher, which is young, uh, but you, uh, you do make that. And uh, you had to have had some setbacks along the way, uh, even as you are in St. Louis, right, as the manager. Once you become a manager, uh, you know, like Wikipedia just makes it a harsh statement. It says that you were fired, right? If I'm a pastor and I, I, I experience that, I'm trying to make sense of what does this mean for me? How do you navigate that? How do you navigate, you know, in a losing season somewhere where radio personalities are weighing in with a lot of opinions? And we all know their opinions are not always honest opinions. They're opinions that create drama for viewers and all that. That's my opinion. So, uh, but you, how do you I'm gonna call it differentiate. How do you separate yourself from the emotional energy of people around you to hold on to yourself and the identity that God gives you? Yeah, that's um, not a strong suit of mine. Um, I, I think I'm wired like many um, to be a people pleaser and was able to do that, whether it was even through my career, my job as a catcher, uh, I, I wasn't I, I wasn't a great player, uh, but I was able to be 
part of a great team and I, I knew my piece and I knew how to make other people around me better, which then allowed me to do the catching position really well, which actually kind of naturally um, translates well into the managing. It's not about you, it's about other people. That's what a, a coach truly does. Um, but you still, um, the, the transition into managing and understanding that that's a position uh, that you need to have a, a pretty good embrace of in the beginning that it, it's not a popularity contest. And if you are trying to do that, you're probably not gonna be around very long, but still nonetheless, it's, it's not easy to get some of that negativism uh, and, and where it, it beats you down. Um, and so what I've, I've tried to do once again is uh, surround myself with truth tellers yes. um, and not, not people that are gonna tell me what I wanna hear, uh, but let me know when I am getting off track and then trying to, to, to keep the first things first and making sure that this is what we've set out to do. This is how we said we're going to go about doing it. And regardless of the noise on the outside, are, are we staying true to that task? And it comes down to how are we treating people? Uh, how are we going about our business? And, and are, are we, we setting aside and doing the commitments that we said that we were going to do? Are we doing this in a way um, that's that's representative of this organization. And, and on the personal level, am I going about this in a way that's exemplifying um, the kind of life that I'm supposed to be leading as a follower of Christ? And so uh, with that, it makes it easier um, to stay on task, whether it is when you get fired, um, when I got fired, to be able to go back and to kind of go through that checklist. Did, did I stay the course and, and did, did I do what I say I was going to do? Uh, was I consistent with, with how I went about my business? Yeah. And then trust the fact that you know what, um, in, my, in my position, you're either going to die or you're going to get fired. I mean, one of those two are kind of going to happen. And, <laughs> right. and you kind of know that going in. And I think um, just coming back to a heart of gratitude, um, understanding that every single day that I had in that position, whether it was in St. Louis, I was grateful for those days, the relationships I was able to build. And I, I think it's, it's more of a, a mentality and more of a mindset, um, whether you're looking for the negative or if you're truly just chasing uh, the positives that have been done and the ones that are still lying ahead. And so when that happened in St. Louis, um, I was grateful for the opportunity. I should have never been, able, should have never been given that job. I, I didn't deserve that. I, that was such a God thing for me to see. Yeah. Not, not that I can explain it to anybody else that yeah. they'll ever understand it, but for me, I knew that I didn't deserve that. And this was, that. There, God's hand was on this. Let's be, let's be faithful with it, right? And when it ended, you know what? Um, it's not necessarily, I'm not saying this was God's plan, but I, I knew there was a purpose and I'm thankful. Now what? And yeah. being able to walk into this situation in Kansas City, I know why. Mm. And, and to me, uh, couldn't be any happier th than where I am right now. This is where I'm supposed to be. And so I want to be faithful now with this new challenge. Yes. And there's going to be noise. And you know what? The, the longer I'm in it, it doesn't make it any easier, especially when some of the stuff comes and you, and you know it's just not accurate. Yeah. Um, but you know, part of the reason um, I love this job is, is I get to be the dartboard. And if I can take some of the stuff that keeps it off of my guys, uh, that's what I love to do. I love wow. to stand in there and, and take it, um, and, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, I, I don't love it, I don't ask for it, but when it comes, let's go with it and let's keep rolling in the direction that we know is gonna, one, uh, represent this organization well, two, I'm called to, to with everything I put my hand to do, yes. uh, do it with everything I got, I'm, we're supposed to win. And so yeah, yeah. we're gonna go out and we're gonna play this game, we're gonna prepare, we're gonna compete, uh, all with the idea of winning because that's what we signed up for, but with that in that in mind, the bigger the bigger thing is is impact. Yeah. And am I making an impact um, on the guys who are down there watching every day? Uh, am I making an impact in this community and hopefully for the Kansas City Royals organization? Well, you absolutely are. Let me break in one more time and tell you about ReadingRevival.com. R-E-D-I-N-K Revival.com. I want to encourage you to sign up for our blog e-newsletter there, as every month it will hit your inbox with a provocative blog post with topics about theology, biblical architecture for emotions, and how understanding the human brain is so helpful in giving more insights to various biblical texts. We also will feature updates on our monthly events to help you keep up on the ready for everything that is available to you. 
Also, I'd like to remind you, if this podcast is serving you with valuable insights, to subscribe to the podcast. If you think someone else would benefit from it, please review it, comment, and share it on your social media platforms. If your friends are privileged to know what's helping you, who knows what God might do in their life with the same resources. That would be a gift to us, and it would be a gift to all your friends. We're holding you in our hearts and believing God with you for a year of supernatural increase. And to be fair, in case anybody who's listening and watching, you're, uh, when you became manager at St. Louis, you were hired, even though they had interviewed a bunch of people who had a much higher profile, they had managed before, et cetera. They hire you and immediately you began to hit the winds and God favored you. There was just such grace there. You had tremendous success uh, in those, particularly the early part of your years there. And, uh, and you are, I mean, you just see the heart of, of a winner when you are around Mike Matheny. Um, so when you say that you know your heart is to really make sure that the players are, uh, you know, they're being molded, they're being influenced. Um, when, when you think of, I mean, these players, they are, they are high skill, high uh, potential, high capacity guys come rolling in. And, uh, and a lot of them, you know, they have maybe egos and there's a lot that goes into the personality of these guys. When they come rolling in, what are you, Mike Matheny, as Jesus follower, as manager, as uh, a leader, an influencer of people's not just professional life, but their whole life. What are you thinking about? How do you, what are you going to do with these guys? How are you going to influence them? Well, first, um, you know, I, I believe uh, trust is the first thing that has to come. So, you know, I was given this position uh, just over a year ago and right away tried to fly around the country and meet with as many guys as I could and spend time talking on the phone, just getting to know them. But trust only comes with time and experiences. Yes. And, and so it's just been trying to build up that trust over time. I also believe um, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And so that has to, to come in time also. So it's been kind of laying those foundations uh, from the start and just trying to, to build relationship. And uh, as far as faith goes, this has always been a, um, uh, something that, that um, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go about this. I believe that um, Reverend Billy Graham, you know, share the gospel at all times when absolutely necessary, use words. And so um, what I try to do inside that clubhouse, and I don't put a lot of pressure on these guys. And we don't have faith conversations unless they open that door. And, and I'm praying for those doors to be open and that I don't miss it. Um, but in the meanwhile, these guys go through life. And I think that's something that people miss. Um, they see these guys who, uh, man, most of them look like Greek gods, right? <laughs> They're out there and, and you forget how young they are because you watch them day in, day out, do what they do. And, and you, you forget that they are not immune to life and its struggles. And th one of the greatest things that I feel that I get uh, invited into are those conversations um, about life and about some of the things that they're struggling with. And so uh, I used the word empathy a little earlier is just trying to put them in, in, you know, get into their shoes and figure out, wow, you know, how are they even, we've got some guys who are on that field. I can't believe they ever even got off of the, the island of the Dominican Republic, that they ever got out of some of the slums where they came from with, with no parental guidance, not right. one male role model in their life, period. How did they ever even get here? And, and thinking about all the advantages I was given all the way through, I have no excuse. These guys have lots of excuses and they continue to kind of beat the odds, um, but there's, there's still stuff that gets in the way. So well, I, I believe we're, we're called, and once again, going back to that John 3, 16, love the world. And, and that's not just inside the church walls. I mean, that's, that's getting our hands dirty in people's lives and rolling up our sleeves and like, all right, where are you, man? What, what can I do to help? And, and let them know, you know, when they open those doors, I'm going to pray for you because that's actually the best thing I can do yeah, for you. Yeah. Um, besides that, I'm just going to be an ear. I'm going to be available. I'm not going to jam Jesus down your throat. Yep. Um, that name, his name doesn't even come, come up. 
uh, but, but we just get into life and, and serve them. And I think that's how we love. And that word love is so jacked up in our language. I see it as a deep and genuine concern for, for, for somebody. And, and I love these guys. And I'll tell them, freaks them out. I'm all right with that. Uh, but I tell them anyhow, and like, hey, I love you and I care about you. And I, I, I want to figure out how to help you get through this. And that to me is the, the greatest honor you can have as a coach. Yeah. Uh, and, and to do it at this level when, and I think uh, being able to have a little bit of a history of being in the game, um, understanding some of the, the temptations and, and some of the struggles, uh, some of the stresses that are unique to what we do. I think it's helpful. Um, been there, been through it. Um, here's some ideas and let's, let's try and figure out how to help you navigate because this isn't easy. And I think it's harder right now maybe than any other time. Yeah. Um, I think for kids in general, let alone 20-somethings with more fame, um, more uh, funding to, to yeah, could right. lead you in any kind of direction, more people trying to cling on and, and yeah. take all the time, just cling ons that are, are trying to tear them down. Um, and then social media, not ever letting them turn off being, oh, yeah. being the baseball player to where they can just be the person. So with all those things uh, combined, I, I think it's, it's time that coaches truly understand uh, the unique stresses that are put on these kids and, and how can we show up and, and just give them the kind of love and, and the leadership and the direction and then you know, help them try to navigate some really difficult waters. Wow, wow. When you are doing the, you know, talking about developing trust, such a huge thing, and then you lay that, I love you, man, on. You're a leader. You're making decisions as to whether that person's gonna be on the field or not be on the field, whether they're gonna to continue to be a part of the team or not a part of the team. How do you navigate leadership where you are all in sincere, loving guys, you're building trust, but they know that you're going to be blatantly honest with their situation. How do you do that, not just from a uh, execution side, but from an emotional side? How do you hang on to yourself to be able to, to do that? And this is, of course, applying to everybody in any environment of leadership, because we should be caring for the people that we're leading. So how do you do it? Yeah, and that's um, it's a tough balance. Um, you know, I've, I've committed uh, to this idea of radical candor. There's a book out that talks about that. Of just, I'm going to be as honest. And, and I think to build trust, you have to you yeah. have to do that. And or else these guys sniff it out. Are, are, it's unbelievable. Their um, their sensitivity to garbage um, and and lies and insincerity is so ultra high. Uh, because there's so many people that are trying to, that, with ulterior motives. And so, um, and, and it's taken a while because as a player, I was always trying to be the guy that just kind of be a chameleon to my pitcher. Who do you need me to be? I'm going to go out and I'm going to get in this guy's face and I'm going to chew him out. The next guy, if I did that, he'd crumble. I need to go out and pat him on the butt and tell him he looks really good on TV today. <laughs> I mean, and, and th there, there's only so much you yeah. can do of that uh, as a manager or else you start to lose uh, lose that trust. But uh, to me, it is being very candid and having those conversations, I believe, in management by walking around. So I make have a touch point with each guy each day, uh, especially the guys uh, that, that aren't playing very much. And I give them an opportunity. Um, but I'm also very clear to them, as I'm clear to, to some guys who maybe were a frontline guy that, that's going on to the bench and let them know that, hey, listen, th there's a responsibility. I care about you as a person. I really want you to do well, uh, but I have a responsibility to this organization above my responsibility for you. Yeah. And so what I do when I put you out there, I'm, I'm hopeful that I put you in a place uh, and you make it just so, so good, blatant man. and obvious that, that you're never given that that back. That's yours, right? And I want to. And but the thing and the truth is, is when I put another guy out there at that same position, I'm hoping the same for him. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do we balance that? I, I, I'm just going to give you opportunity, and after that, you got to have to make the most of it. And and if they know that's that's the heart, um, they're not always going to agree. That they, they they want more time, they want more opportunity. Yeah. Um, but then it comes down to once again, um, you know, th this isn't. Uh, uh, a situation where it's, it's, it's a unilateral decision. We, we come together and I have some incredible coaches that I lean on very heavy, uh, Dayton Moore in the front office. How do we get all that information together? Help us make good decisions with our personnel. Try to build them up, try to grow them, try to put them in situations to succeed. But in the end, we gotta do what's best for the Kansas City Royals. And uh, if 
They're not always going to like it, but if they understand that, that our motives are pure and that we're, we're giving them opportunities, and then some of it relies on their shoulders, then we understand uh, that we're all, uh, we're all just going to do the best we can with what we've been given. I couldn't be more pleased to be a Kansas City Royals fan, uh, getting to spend this time with you and hear your heart. It's, uh, it's a real joy to my heart. Oh, thank you. And I'm excited for all of our listeners and, and our church to be able to experience you. I feel the same about Dayton, Moore, uh, our GM. Uh, I, I am with all that goes on in the world today and there's so many tensions and conflicts I'm so proud to know that from the top, uh, we have such character, such morality, such honesty. Um, and it makes me excited every year. I'm real excited about our upcoming season. I'm excited for what you were able as a team to accomplish at the end of this, uh, this past season and, uh, and believe that our future is, is really bright. I can't wait for another world championship. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I believe that you guys have it in route. Um, Mike, I just uh, I want to say thank you again for being a part of Red Ink Revival's Leadership Podcast and a guest at LifePoint Church. Um, you're the real deal, man. Well, work in progress, and uh, praise God he doesn't give up on us and keeps uh, chipping away the garbage. But uh, honored to be here, honored to be a part of this community. I've been blown away uh, by the love and support and the kindness we've been given uh, while we've been in Kansas City. And uh, people do need to understand that this is a very unique organization. I haven't been a part of all 30, uh, but when you have the kind of leadership that we have um, from Dayton, uh, from Mr. John Sherman, and uh, the kind of people and, and how uh, the care level here for how people care about people, mm -hmm. um, whether they throw any kind of title on top of it, of, well, I'm doing it because of this, it, it's different and uh, it's unique and it is an absolute honor to be a part of.